Welcome everyone to the inaugural event of the new Arts and Human Rights Research Cluster of the Human Rights Institute here at UConn. The Arts and Human Rights Cluster explores how the arts can promote the full exercise of human rights and the consolidation of a democratic culture. And we focus on how the arts can act as a powerful means of sustaining individual and collective reflection on human rights and of the linking and of linking individual and collective public experience, social belonging and citizenship. My name is Robin Greeley. I'm associate professor of art history here at UConn and a member of the arts and human rights cluster. And we hope you will join us in advancing this compelling new field of advancement for human rights. It is my great pleasure to introduce Gary English, Yukon Board of Trustees Distinguished Professor of Drama, who will be sharing today some of his research on the intersection of theater and human rights. Many of us have benefited enormously from Gary's work as founding artistic director of the Connecticut Repertory Theater here at Yukon, as well as from his national and international reputation in stage directing and design as visiting professor at al Quds University in Palestine and at leading US repertory theater companies, including the Repertory Theater of St. Louis, the San Francisco Playhouse, the Merrimack Repertory Theater and the Berkshire Theater Festival. Gary is also, of course, affiliate faculty at UConn's Human Rights Institute and has played an integral role as artistic director at the Freedom Theater in the Janine refugee camp in Palestine's West Bank. Among his many accomplishments with the Freedom Theater are the building of several new productions, touring initiatives and collaborations throughout the West Bank and internationally in India, Europe and the Americas. Gary also recently published Stories Under Occupation and other Palestinian plays co-edited with Samer al Saber, an anthology of contemporary Palestinian plays created out of the second Intifada and the realities of Israeli occupation that combine activism and critical self-inquiry. Gary will be speaking today about what he calls an aesthetics of human rights inherent in certain modes of dramatic form and structure. And we have three respondents also to Gary's talk today. Asif Majid, Assistant Professor of Dramatic Arts and Human Rights. Glenn Mitoma, who directs the Dodd Impact. And Sebastian Wogenstein, Associate Professor of German Studies. We ask that audience members keep their videos and microphones off during the presentation. After discussion with the respondents, we will open to discussion with the audience. Please post your questions in the chat function. Please join me in welcoming Gary English. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. <clears throat> Good afternoon, and thank you for attending this lunchtime presentation on a project I've been working on for some time. Today is part of a process for me to test my thinking and invite colleagues to respond in order to clarify the work going forward. Today, I will speak about the relationship between theater and human rights, and we'll cover roughly seven topics that will interweave throughout the presentation and include moral theory, theater as aesthetic and sociopolitical practice, overall projects and themes and objectives, the importance of dialectic in representational forms, problems with representational models, problems with emphasizing empathy, non-representational forms and activism, and applied theater research and practice. One important moment that helped shape my early interests in human rights took place in 2004, when Connecticut Repertory Theater hosted the first Human Rights Institute Conference, Human Rights in the War on Terror, that took place on the set for a production of Julius Caesar I was directing at the time. The setting for that conference proved mostly symbolic as panels and speakers did not employ the arts per se, but the production design provided a metaphor power for the conference environment, informed as it was by imagery that evoked simultaneously a fortress and a prison. 
The discourse of the conference and the imagery of the theater gave rise to something akin to Sebastian Bogenstein's restatement of, from Theodor Adorno. The artwork is the point where the movement of spirit and the movement of social reality meet. And it is in this meeting that the relevance of literature or drama for, humans for human rights lies. I recall this story to suggest that drama and theater and perhaps especially forms of tragedy provide a unique public life to experience problems associated with human rights and does so best in my view through the use of dialectic dramatic structures as a model for public discourse or as Paul Cartledge suggests, a rehearsal for democracy. Another influential moment occurred during a televised interview with Martha Nussbaum referencing her book, The Fragility of Goodness, when she articulated the value of stories, plays and particularly Greek tragedy when stating, Tragedy only happens when you are trying to live well, when you are trying to live well, and when you deeply care about the things you're trying to do, the world enters in, in a particularly painful way. And when we try to wrest from the world the good life we desire, that then can lead us into tragedy. Nussbaum further argues that to see the complexity that's there and to see it honestly without flinching, and without redescribing it in terms of excessively simple theory is itself a progress for public life as well as private life because it's only when we have done that step we can ask ourselves how our institutions might make it less likely that these tragic conflicts will happen to our people. This work begins from the premise that facing and honestly engaging in the moral complexity in public and private life provides a necessary precondition to effective public policy. To assist in capturing this complexity, I propose to construct an aesthetics of human rights inherent within a variety of dramatic forms. These forms provide unique public spaces employing what I refer to as investigative dialectics to interrogate human motive and action through dramatic form and dramatic action. I propose four fundamental elements to define an aesthetics of human rights in theater that include some combination of the following. A, a working definition or dialectic on the nature of moral character. B, representational or non-representational performance forms built with dialectic structures and alternating episodes of engagement and estrangement. C, an approach that engages dialogic empathy rather than one-way empathy between observer and artistic object, and D, the use of proto-performance elements to engage in multi-directional dialogue on the nature of the experience. Previous attempts to integrate theater and human rights posit that theater best operates as public presentations or public representations of human rights questions or atrocities to generate empathy or compassion. However, the question of how theater functions as representation seems less fully considered by most critics than what theater represents. Emphasis on what theater represents often focuses on creating pathos or empathy through presentations of victim sufferings due to the inhumanity of perpetrators so often so, I argue, that other more active relationships between theater and human rights garner less attention. While human rights functions as a discipline that investigates atrocities, victims, and perpetrators, attempting to generate pathos with theater, I feel too often produces a public litigation or shame provocation to point toward fault, guilt, and responsibility without a fully contextual understanding of how and why violence breaks out amongst people with legitimate conflicting interests or who at least believe they are trying to do the right thing. Any application of theater as social or political practice, as with purely artistic expression, nevertheless depends on some range of aesthetics and dramaturgical methods to produce a harmony or controlled dissonance of the parts. The structure of the drama and related aesthetics match, comment on, or contradict each other, and the political messages or discourse at hand. Therefore, looking carefully at a variety of forms of drama and theater provides methods of analysis that serve political, social, and cultural functions through both didactic and dialectic approaches. Essential ingredients to fully grasp these functions include analysis of theater as art and or social practice, the complexity of thought and points of view structured into drama through character, dialogue, and dramatic action, 
and performance as markers of human rights issues within local populations during conflict or in post-conflict zones. Proposing an aesthetics of human rights may assist in thinking about what forms of drama create a useful framework for continuing discourse on how theater and human rights intersect. Philosophy and political theory contribute basic understandings about the relationship between moral theory and human rights. Aristotle, Kant, David Hume, Richard Vorty, Hobbes, and others theorize persuasively on the necessity of moral relations. Rana Dworkin articulates a doctrine of equal concern and respect, defined as the state's obligation to treat all persons as moral and political equals. As theater most often casts itself around the plight of individuals caught in a matrix of forces, I argue that to show theater and human rights connect or show how theater and human rights connect, a theory on the nature of individual character is important. Human rights theory seems, however, unintendedly to treat humans as abstract entities, if not objects, that deserve ethical treatment by the state based on either teleological or deontological ethical theory. This approach often reads as a deductive experiment or deductive thought experiment from larger theory, we establish principal treatment of individual people. The term all persons appears in human rights documents without, for obvious reasons, ever specifying this particular person. The drama personalizes moral and political issues, presenting flesh and blood reality in front of us, amounting to an inductive experiment from which we transfer the experience to broader applications. Dramatists place the individual in relation to their environment through what Stanislavski calls given circumstances. Therefore, borrowing from Martha Nussbaum, and in order to fully understand fully the value of drama relative to moral theory and human rights, we need a clear view of moral character. What is the nature of good character itself? As Plato claims, does virtuous character result from the application of reason is self-sufficient and impervious to external forces? Or as Nussbaum plain insists following Aristotle, does character remain vulnerable due to our commitments and the world's intervention? Can good characters suffer, suffer potential destruction from external forces? Again, as Nussbaum argues, drama provides a more nuanced moral theory due to dramaturgically constructed character virtues and flaws not always easily distinguishable from each other. Complex humans with moral commitments suffer the complicity of or assault from external forces that may destroy our material reality, but also our ability to hold moral ground or maintain compassion and empathy. Political theater at its best builds complex moral dilemmas in which the protagonist either succumbs to or transcends the given circumstances that defines them. I will argue that the most effective human rights drama utilizes forms that disrupt us the most, causing discomfort, emotional and intellectual engagement with strong dialogic structures in situations with deeply conflicted and morally ambiguous claims. This project develops a theoretical foundation and provides methodologies to investigate human rights questions from within the perspective of theater as a discipline. I also position theater as a method of examination, or as Alexander Baumgarten discussed, art as a way of knowing or sensitive logic, rather than emphasizing the more limited, however important purposes that art serve to raise consciousness that accompany other often consider more primary modes of analysis. A main feature of this work includes the integration of applied theater research and practice and critical ethnography with more typical theater and performance studies research. The study constructs a broad analysis showing how theater and human rights operates beyond the arts as representation model and offers a primary mode of analysis, activism, and public discourse. I will offer details following each of the four overarching themes that organize the substance of the project. One, in attempting to clarify an aesthetics of human rights, I emphasize dialectic forms of theater structure that humanizes the intense complexity of conflicting rights. Two, to indicate how theater functions as successful activist tactics in legitimizing human rights claims in a variety of circumstances. Three, 
to offer a more comprehensive set of dramaturgical methods than hitherto presented to categorize and critique various theater and dramatic forms in relationship to human rights. And four, employing some of these methods establish how theater functions as a distinct research methodology to evaluate human rights questions in specific conflicts. Number one, theme one, aesthetics and dialectic forms. Theater that focuses only on representation of suffering may minimize complexity without investigating root causes of conflict or how individual or group rights operate in conflict with each other. However, when representation of political conflicts is the main objective, I will demonstrate how theater most effectively intersects with human rights when theater employs a dynamic investigative dialectic between complex multiple perspectives. Human rights as a discipline addresses universal rights across societies in concert with more narrowly defined civil rights issues within societies. As a result, there appears a contradiction or perhaps a paradox between the microscopic nature of theater and the international scope of human rights theory. Theater describes precise moments in time and space where conditions and experience of a particular individual or small group are examined. However, treating these types of drama as inductive logic allows us to imagine how human rights questions flow out from individuals through societies and across national boundaries. One tool, partly inspired by Brecht, Bertolt Brecht's theory on epic theater and performance studies, is the importance of considering the body in performance. The study of the body provides an essential understanding of how theater creates complex dialectics where the actor functions as character, commentator, and activist simultaneously. In these largely non-representational forms, the actor character's performance in public space does not represent something that exists in any temporal reality, but rather creates an imagined and original socio-aesthetic form that challenges our understanding of the status quo. Further, the use of the body of one ethnic or national group to inhabit a character from another especially one from a remote geographical space, challenges our internalized impression of each. As Brecht implies, this effect requires us to reevaluate something we believe to be true only by virtue of it being familiar and forces us to contend with what now becomes newly and perhaps uncomfortably unfamiliar. That then challenges our original assumptions. For example, in the Freedom Theater production of The Island by Alpha Fugard, Winston Michona, and John Connie, Palestinian actors embody characters written as South African political prisoners. On tour abroad, the production forced audiences to contend with this duality and the cognitive dissonance of both identities merging into something hybridist, unique, and not representative of anything. Here, as in Brecht, the play functions as a mediator between what we consider familiar and sympathetic South African political prisoners and that which we consider unfamiliar and perhaps unsympathetic Palestinian political prisoners. Despite any inherent biases, the effect disorients and challenges the audience when faced with the obvious humanity of the men on stage revealed in all their vulnerabilities. These creative acts allow us to imagine how renderings of local human rights conflicts expand to a transnational context. Theme two, theater as resistance tactics. Some argue that theater best functions in relationship to human rights through representational structures and caution against theater as effective activism, as opposed to social criticism or empathy generation. However, by looking at the use of applied theater forms as practiced in the field as resistance tactics, we see that theater does allow groups to enumerate and assert their rights as, for example, in the case studies offered by Sayini Madison in Acts of Activism, Human Rights as Radical Performance. Theme three, dramaturgical methods. Dramaturgical structures range across a variety of forms and offer a comparative method and insight into the objectives of the work. Dramatic structure determines the internal logic or organization of theater to accomplish specific goals. Some of these structural methods operate as binaries and include theater that is uh, fundamentally disruptive or conforms with social norms, theater that employs dialogic or monologic forms, theater that embodies a search for justice or reconciliation, theater that is ideological or non-ideological, 
theater that focuses on the psyche of victims and or perpetrators, theater created from the margins or center of society, theater that attempts to create empathy within or across cultural or ethnic boundaries, theater that defers empathy construction in favor of developing authentic political agency, and theater that is realistic or abstract, employing linear or nonlinear narratives. Theme four, theater as research methodology. The study of theater in conflict zones and in post-conflict can reveal how local communities view which human rights questions affect them most deeply, how those communities see themselves in relation to specific rights or capabilities, and also reveal the capacity or risks for those communities to affect their circumstances or enter into various political processes, such as attempts at community reconciliation. For the purposes of this project, Research regarding theater and human rights up to now falls into three general categories. First, theater and performance studies often critiques performance oriented towards social justice. This research up to now only occasionally employs the terminology of human rights. The second category includes applied theater research as described in projects such as Performance in Place of War by James Thompson, Jenny Hughes, and Michael Balfour, and research a radical departure by Peter O'Connor and Michael Anderson. These projects discuss applied theater research that do not generally employ the language of human rights directly, but offer methods of research practice to ask questions about how theater functions in post-conflict, prisons or other settings where human rights questions arise sometimes by other means. The third category includes examples of performance studies research connected to critical ethnography and participatory observation, such as those championed by Dwight Conkergood and Soyini Madison, who advocate the study of performance activity designed to claim human rights in specific settings. Applied theater research, a large and robust field often operates independently from other forms of performance research. Within the two major anthologies published in the last 10 years regarding theater and human rights, the authors mentioned applied theater briefly in one introduction, and few of the chapters in either volume involve case studies connected to applied theater practice. More recently, performance studies and theater research employ critical ethnography in studying performance where participatory theater and theater research overlap. However, scholars rarely demonstrate or imagine an intersection between human rights and theater performance and research. As a result, the currently published work on theater and human rights remains quite narrowly defined, often as an extension of literary studies and not regularly published by scholars who work in the field as ethnographers, theater artists, applied theater specialists, or human rights activists. To sum up, performance studies scholars and ethnographers touch on human rights as an important theme and objective. Applied theater artists and researchers refer to human rights but focus on social impact, and theater scholars of dramatic literature and regional studies occasionally address human rights and performance, but generally only as representation. Fully integrating these areas of research and scholarship provides a detailed map how theater and human rights operates beyond the arts as representation model and offers a primary methodology for analysis, activism, and political discourse. As the human rights international regime expanded since the first declaration from 1948, interdisciplinary collaborations developed with an array of academic subjects and social practices, including humanitarianism, international law, social sciences, the humanities, economics, and others. As to the arts in general, and theater in particular, a similar construction remains elusive. A small number of works, including one monograph, two edited volumes, one book on applied theater practice, and a handful of book chapters and journal articles have been published that indicate a relationship between theater and human rights. Theater often provides representations of human rights question, questions by dramatizing human experience embodied within various works to develop empathy on the part of the public for individuals or groups. Derbyshire and Hobson describe this often assumed role as the theatrical treatment of human rights allows for the dissemination of information, the arousal of compassion, 
and the raising of consciousness in a way that is particular to that form. Presenters and scholars sometimes compare these works against prescriptions established by the Universal Declaration to show how various actors violate human rights. Certainly valuable in raising consciousness, this approach provides important functions. Partnerships develop regularly to take advantage of the arts. A unique position to work in this manner. Editors Becker, Hernandez, and Worth argue that theater functions best as representations by claiming that theater as a minority practice cannot reasonably be expected to prevent human rights violations. As Brenda Worth points out, what these diverse questions concern is the nature of theater as a distinctive represent representational practice. However, little published material exists regarding the complexity and contradictory sets of empathic responses that develop on the part of an audience or how aesthetic structures provide a deeper understanding of important human rights questions through a distinctively dialectic rather than didactic approach. What feels absent in many of these analyses when addressing exactly what is being re represented or how are the ways theater creates public debate through non-representative forms that de-emphasize empathy and provide provocative public discourse or calls to action. Theater in general and scholars may suffer from an overdependence on mimesis, which often places characters or forces in binary opposition, where we primarily experience a rendering of perpetrators and victims. This structure of perpetrators and victims neglects theater as dialectically complex as, for example, through the use of unresolvable moral dilemmas. And we may lose an essence of how theater provides a distinctive form of representation that is challenging us to hold multiple truths simultaneously. For example, in the play Death and the Maiden by Ariel Dorfman, we encountered the character of Pauline. As a victim of rape and torture, her compelling and unspeakable experience affects the audience deeply as representative of the intense suffering of others thus creating empathy for victims of other specific atrocities. Scholars and presenters often select this play to illustrate the history of human rights abuse in Chile and South America as essentially a didactic approach. And social scientists or literature scholars often employ the play as an object or representation of a particular victim's experience to investigate and humanize broader historical events. However, Looking at the dramaturgical design of the triangular relationship between the three characters, Paulina, her husband, Gerardo, and accused torturer, Dr. Roberto Miranda, the play provides a construction to debate larger questions directly related to the delicacy of democracy and human rights in post-conflict. Shifting patterns between the three characters drive each at various moments to function as a mediator, prosecutor, or defendant with shifting alliances. The playwright creates dramatic conflict where the audience must lean in and align with diverse and complex points of view that are malleable and conflict from moment to moment. The dialect that takes place as a result might occur between audience members, but more importantly, within the individual audience member. The form and structure of the play, as much or more than the content, evokes even anticipates the all too common frictions between attempts to achieve both justice and reconciliation found in many post-conflict zones. Studying the play provides a primary means to understand the complexity of the issues rather than only as a demonstration of the issues raised through other means. Death and the Maiden is not a play about human rights primarily because it represents a victim of torture and the presumed torturer. It is a play about human rights because in the embodied experience of the characters, especially the husband Gerardo, we bear witness to two difficult and complex political realities. First, that the social objectives of justice and reconciliation conflict, threaten each other within the same political and physical space. And second, that the state is incapable in many instances of reconciling this conflict to the satisfaction of either justice or reconciliation. In producing the play Antigone, various groups utilize the main character as a rebel 
who courageously opposes a tyrant and morally corrupt king. Some Athenians remain skeptical of democracy, and Athens only granted rights based on citizenships. Socrates and Plato considered Antigone's claim that individual or universal rights trump civil obligations as radical and dangerous. The Greeks were wary of blind familial loyalty and were well aware of demands made by so-called universal law, such as revenge. In the play Agamemnon, Electra demands her brother Orestes kill their mother for the murder of their father. While Sophocles posed important questions for the Athenian audience to debate, today Antigone often reverberates as an allegory, with Antigone making the only ethical argument as she confronts tyranny. But this reduction does not, in my view, offer dramatic conflict that would have been understood by the Greeks or contemporary audiences as more complex. To revisit this complexity, other playwrights, including John Ennui, position the play differently by looking carefully at relationships. Likewise, in my own adaptation, I focused on the family as well as the state to reveal the central theme of the play, the position of love in public life. Through compassion and social justice, or in protections of the vulnerable, love must inform all civil law as well as family obligations. Creon attempts control through fear as his expression of love for his city. To Antigone, love defines our values in all public life to instill hope free from fear. In Antigone, this conflict concerns public versus fam familial obligations. Thus, the play moves back and forth between the realms of the family and the state. Creon is Antigone's uncle, and she believes the gods demand her to act, but it is her own inherent moral compass based on family obligation that motivates her choice. The Creon is not a villain. While his version of love manifests as control and the fear he invokes, it is still his version of love, his version of moral duty. He loves his country and believes sacrifices must be made to preserve it. It is in the disconnect between his motives and his methods where his particular tragedy may be found. We should remember that the play takes place immediately after a brutal civil war that threatens everyone. The effects of trauma on the characters motivates each in their own way. To clarify why legitimate conflict between these various perspectives in both plays is essential, I'm attracted by the principle Harold Pinter suggested, the more political we are in theater, the more scrupulously objective we must be. The clash between civil authority, individual rights, and familial obligation has a long and bloody history. Both plays attempt to reveal as deeply as possible the nature of these conflicts within the state and the family. Death and the Maiden and Antigone work as human rights plays, not because they enumerate, envision, enact, and legitimize particular rights or represent suffering, but because they demonstrate a major question in human rights. That is how rights and attempts at empathy construction offer it, often operate in opposition to each other. I suggest that studying these plays should be thought of as process rather than considering them as artifacts or products. Western narrative theater typically places the individual at the center of drama. Consistent with Martha Nussbaum, again, her emphasis on individual character, this form creates the trope of the tragic hero or figure who must face a variety of external forces that challenge their capacity to function in a moral way. Stanislavski restates this ingredient of dramatic form as given circumstances. When he asks what personal, social, historical, and philosophical restraints or expectations rob the character of political agency or motivate them into believable responses. I regularly argue to students that in this form, drama always interrogates how the main figure transcends or not those given circumstances. Examples include Hamlet, who rejects the role of revenge murderer, Orestes, who demands justice in lieu of healing, or John Proctor from the Crucible, who refuses to cooperate with a corrupt system of justice. These examples and innumerable others point to the dramaturgical requirement of plausibility as introduced by Aristotle. The plausible impossibility is preferable to the implausible possibility. 
Aristotle couples plausibility with an internal structure based on causality. That is, each dramatic event logically motivates the next to a believable conclusion. Stanislavski reinterpreted these elements in theater and realism in order to reflect life as it is, as opposed to some other imagined world. Peter Brook refers to this type of theater as a collective yes, or consistent with social expectations of believability based on agreed social and political norms. However, Bertolt Brecht argues that Stanislavski in particular and realism in general functions as a form of social coercion. If drama represents the world as we believe it is, then the only plausible conclusions must conform to the worldview of a particular audience. This implies that suffering of individuals in so-called realistic plays occurs due, if you like, to certain natural laws. The structure of the play mirrors the social structure of the world as we see it. While representational theater need not always focus on individual suffering and their conditions, I argue that even when the representation focuses on ideas manifesting in individuals, as in Death and the Maiden, the product designed by the playwright is not pathos, but thought and a disruption of our preconceived bias. For this reason, Ariel Dorfman refuses to resolve clearly whether the accused torturer, Dr. Miranda, is guilty or not. The play provides a disruption, even confusion, when faced with two meta-interests, justice and reconciliation. Brecht claims that when playwrights deploy realism to produce empathy, audiences find it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to challenge the given circumstances of the play. Emotional connection hypnotizes the audience, disconnecting them from their rational or observational skills. Empathy, often a desired product of both human rights and drama, Brecht argues, distracts us from the major questions at hand, and as I will discuss later on, does not guarantee and may undermine political action. As Lindsay Cummings point out, points out in her research, Empathy in these cases moves in one direction only, is fixed, non-dynamic, and rarely operates as dialogic or shared with the, with the point of view of the subject. For Brecht, this means that in realism, the event depends entirely on the audience's members' feelings. Once we experience those feelings, the event is complete. At that point, the audience members' own feelings are the event, and more important than the suffering of the character. We feel good, about feeling bad. Many believe empathy remains an important objective of theater practice. As Aristotle wrote, pity and fear result from the representation. In her work on documentary theater, Brenda Wirth argues that theater produces a complex and compelling set of identificatory processes and empathic, empathic responses to the presentation of human rights abuses. Mary Luckhurst and Emily Marin in their book, Theater and Human Rights Since 1945, utilize the term, the unspeakable, that audiences confront. So one relationship between theater and human rights humanizes various subjects through representations of suffering in order to elicit empathic responses by the audience. But the question is, what sort of empathy? In Empathy and Dialogue and Theater and Performance, Lindsay Cummings makes compelling arguments that critique generalized assumptions regarding theater as an engine for empathy. Cummings argues that empathy functions best as dialogic, operating in directions in both directions between artist and audience. In most narrative or realistic theater, empathy operates in one direction only, that is from the spectator to the aesthetic object, or in our case, from the audience to the stage. This single directional empathy can also occur in human rights, social services, uh, other international forms of humanitarianism, and even some types of ill-practiced ethnography. Some of the problems arising from single directional or non-dialogic empathy, Cummins discuss includes, we may only empathize with the familiar. We are more inclined to empathize with people we find attractive and those who look like us or share our ethnic or national background. 
This may actually encourage tribalized alignments rather than openness to experience from an alternative point of view. Non-dialogic empathy often results in misguided projections. This constitutes a misattribution that may alter the experience to fit our own needs. Three, attempts at identification actually lessen or lessens the importance and uniqueness of experience and dilutes it, sometimes through harmful oversimplifications. Non-dialogic empathy can be intrusive. In nine dialogic empathy, the empathizer seeks similarities, determining what values and experience merit the appellation of human. If the previous dynamics operate against the subject, the product may only confirm a view of the other as inhumane. To prevent these problems, coming states, Dialogic empathy never arrives as an endpoint of understanding or actual complete identification, but changes over time and exchange, cohabiting, enriching to allow individuals to consider multiple points of view. The dynamic give and take that I have attributed to theater does not in itself guarantee respectful dialogic empathy. To achieve this, we have to attend to our own motives and desires as well as to directly experience how our engagement is received. Dialogue is emergent rather than preformed, fluid rather than static, keenly dependent on process, at least as much as content, performative rather than representational, and never fully finished rather than completed. Dialogic dramatic forms plus proto-performance structures such as organized talkbacks or other interactions play an essential role in whether dialogic empathy takes place in addition to whether the play operates as complex dialectics, as in Death and the Maiden. Often the two concepts go hand in hand. Narrative and realistic forms, such as those based in Stanislavski methods, naturally limit dialogic empathy due to the same internal structures discussed earlier, including social expectations that encourage plausibility and causality in theater. By contrast, to theater as narrative representations of either suffering or ideas, theater practitioners utilizing epic theater forms from Brecht and applied theater emphasize non-representational forms and dialogic empathy by focusing on engaged relationships between theater activity and communities particularly while employing dramaturgical devices such as stage interventions, metatextual elements, or participatory theater connected to social action. One of my favorite techniques is what I refer to as inappropriate behaviors, which assigns one action to a behavior that contradicts our expectations. Think, for example, someone singing a lullaby gently moving side to side in a summer dress, a beautiful hat, and handling a knife, while the text concerns itself with revolutionary rhetoric and the guillotine during the French Revolution. Such a scene appears in Marat Saad by Peter Weiss, originally directed by Peter Brook. The juxtaposition forces us to reconsider the character and the subject, often without any clear expectation of empathy. Another structural element employed by Brecht and others, including Frank Galati, includes a narrator who interrupts the action with commentary, forcing the audience to gauge with multiple realities. This method acknowledges there is no realistic illusion associated with this type of theater. Other examples of the narrator device can be seen in plays of Peter Schaefer, including Royal Hunt of the Sun, about the destruction of the Incan Empire, and Equus, where the main character, a psychiatrist, speaks directly to the audience regarding a teenage patient who, in a psychotic episode, blinds a group of horses. These devices provide a form of alienation, or as Breck termed it, the Verfremdungs effect, partly inspired by Hannah Arendt and Karl Marx. The purpose of these devices, in addition to providing a pause or interruption to produce thought, also provides a means to challenge our assumptions regarding the given circumstances as necessary, plausible, or inevitably causal. 
the presentation of a personage or object we consider familiar in an unfamiliar or radically conflicting form challenges our pre our excuse me challenges our perceptions and biases about the original object when examining specific plays by Harold Pinter, as with mountain language, for instance, we experience a stage reality unrelated to any specific nominal understanding of the world. The play doesn't represent anything or necessarily predicts a particular emotional response. It exists in its own form, but nevertheless exudes deeply political resonance. Applied theater employs Brechtian elements as a social and political intercession. How one question Julio, Julian Boal, who created the theater of the oppressed, often asked is, how can we change the conditions or the given circumstances in order to create real dialogue? Theater of the oppressed uses non-representational forms, dialogic empathy, and staged interruptions through the use of a narrator or joker to create dialogue between performer and the audience, sometimes during the play. Theater of the Oppressed and other forms of applied theater offer methods of community development or activism that support field work in human rights as forms non-dependent on professional actors, but make use of participatory theater. Applied theater can also enhance curriculum in human rights as a way to engage dialogic empathy in field work. Theater as research methodology. A few years ago, I approached, uh, I was approached by a university in the United States to cooperate on a reconciliation project operating with the University of Haifa and areas around Jerusalem. The project created opportunities between Arab Israelis and Jewish Israelis to cooperate in various types of activities to offer space or for reconciliation between these two often violently conflicted groups. The program leaders invited me to join the project to extend the program across the Green Line into the West Bank due to my extended time working there with cultural organizations and wanted me to suggest partners. After considering their proposal flawed, I declined and discouraged them from pursuing it further. While international NGOs operate reconciliation programs in post-conflict such as in the Congo and Rwanda, their successes depend on the participants' view of themselves as actually living in post-conflict, as opposed to a continuing conflict. While some Palestinians living in Israel view their particular issues as civil rights within a functioning state in post-conflict, West Bank Palestinians generally view their conflict with Israel as ongoing. I communicated to the group that no cultural, political, or civil society programs in the West Bank would cooperate because they would consider it normalizing the occupation. The project would fail. Or worse, might place West Bank individuals at risk as the boycott of Israel remains a fundamental tactic in resisting the military occupation of Lebanon. To this point, I argue that Artists provide unique perspectives to illuminate which human rights questions should appropriately rise to our attention within conflict or post-conflict and how these questions affect and are perceived as important by individuals and larger groups. Research in applied theater investigates how participatory theater functions in relation to political and social forces at work in various settings. For example, the comprehensive study, performance in place of war, collected data on performance generated from local communities in various stages of conflict and thought of them relative to various systems of measurement. These systems include categorizing performance as acts of resistance, rehumanization, or reconciliation, analysis of cultural products, products across three separate Cartesian axes of orientation and analysis, including time and space, memory and forgetting, and peace and reconciliation, and how applied theater intervenes to address individual collective post-trauma stress disorder. Applied theater research shows how performance affects how human rights are perceived. In some cases, the capacity for public performance at all or of specific material anticipates and predicts what level of rights advocacy might be accomplished politically or 
risk further harm. Examples abound where government and international NGOs sponsored reconciliation projects failed because the target population saw themselves at ground zero of a continuing conflict rather than in post-conflict. And some may have exacerbated circumstances leading to further violence. As I begin my conclusions, I outline seven types of theater with clear connections between theater and human rights. One, Theater humanizes political forces through complex embodied experience and relationships within the material reality of the state. The emphasis here is to define theater practice essentially as an inductive experiment. Two, dialectic theater provokes political discourse within public space, allowing communities to debate solutions to the problems they face. Three, monologic theater provides tactics for resistance, rebellion, or other intentionally disruptive events. Four, participatory or applied theater democratizes public discourse and allows public space for the rehumanization of, rehumanization of victims and oppressed groups and provides a process for psychological renewal, community development, and local social action. Five, documentary theater provides testimony of events as a commemorative or memorial act as a public evidentiary process, process that function as an alternate narrative to state-sponsored or so-called official reports. Six, theater research provides a methodology to discover how human rights questions are viewed by various publics and may anticipate potential political solutions or a lack of capabilities. And seven, experiments in theater and structure and form that de-emphasize realist direct representations utilize radical theater structures that operate as metaphors for radical social change with actors often functioning as both artists and activists simultaneously. Conclusions at this point port toward an invitation for scholars and theater and human rights to consider incorporating an aesthetic of human rights that engages dialectic dramatic structures, illustrating legitimate conflict and employing dialogic empathy. To invite human rights scholars and activists to incorporate applied and participatory theater as a methodology in their research and practice. This could also result in the inclusion of applied and participatory theater into human rights curriculum and research. To encourage theater scholars to more consistently incorporate critical ethnographic approaches and participatory observation with human rights theory into their fieldwork. To encourage, to encourage theater artists to interrogate issues of representation, the desire to create empathy and the ability to build political agency. This work concentrates on dramatic form and structure. It acknowledges that theater exists primarily as a provocative public act. Employing plays as literature in the study of human rights is best accomplished by selecting those marked by dialectic structures, multiple perspectives, and foster dialogic empathy, where rights are presented to be in conflict. By looking carefully at theater practice in conflict and post-conflict zones, NGO human rights and theater scholars may see more clearly how to determine which human rights questions resonate with individuals, communities, and national or ethnic identities. In closing, I would very much like to thank the Human Rights Institute and the Office of the Vice President for Research for funding and supporting this project. And I would also like to thank my colleagues, Lindsay Cummings, and my research assistant, Emma Matthew, for exemplary work during these last months. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gary. That was really great. <laughs> Lots to discuss there. Um, so we'll take a few minutes here to ask Asif and Galen and Sebastian to provide some comments. Uh, meanwhile, people, please uh, start putting your questions and comments into the chat and then we'll get to them as well. Thank you again. Thanks, Robin. Uh, thanks, Gary. Um, really enjoyed that. Got a couple of pages of notes here. Um, a few, diff few different things, um, questions, curiosities. Um, 
I think I want I think I want to start by identifying what seems to me to be um, the challenge that you're attempting to work through here. Um, and you can kind of uh, say whether or not you know I've got this right, which is it seems to me that there is an attempt to reconcile a practice right of, of performance of theater uh, of staged performances in some kind of way with uh, for lack of a better term, kind of a discipline that is seated quite primarily in sort of a legalistic framework. Um, uh, and and sort of a, a regime, you know, human rights as kind of a, a you started with the kind of the philosophical foundations, you know, and sort of the moral theory components. Um, and I I found myself stuck as a consequence of that on this phrase that you mentioned quite early on that human rights is a discipline that investigates atrocities, victims, and perpetrators, right? Um, as that being kind of a, a relatively foundational concept to the way that human rights is being conceptualized in this work for you, um, and therefore affects what kinds of performances are being investigated, I would, I would suggest. Um, and so with that with that thinking, I, I wonder, and I, I have been wondering kind of as you, you shared kind of uh, with Glenn and Sebastian and I and, and Robin, kind of your, you know, like your talk earlier and, and you know, listening to it again now, you know, I wonder actually about if the underpinning connective tissue, for lack of a better term, is actually a question around the role of conflict um, more than it is actually about some of these underpinning moral, you know, philosophical theories and kind of, you know, these, these folks who you've drawn on Aristotle and, and a variety of others. Um, and the reason that I that I wonder that is because, you know, the types of theater, you know, obviously I as as you know, as a as a divisor, you know, I, I kind of think of performance broadly as, you know, performers and an audience in a space. That's kind of it, right? Like that's my sort of my definition of it. And and so there's a whole range that that could include. But in this case, it seems that what's what's at play is 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 really centrally sort of like staged performances that are considering these sort of questions of atrocities, considering these questions of conflict context and considering these questions of conflict as energy, right? And so I wonder what it would mean or what it could mean to investigate and think about an organizing principle being around conflict um, and what, what that could do to the sort of the shape of, of some of the argument or the shape of some of the questions that you're raising. Um, I have many more things, but I think that's I will okay. <laughs> park it there um, to make sure that there's time for Glenn and uh, Sebastian to also speak. Yeah, that's all right. Should I respond or should I wait? Oh gosh, um, I I don't. Let's I think go you ahead. Could, that's yeah, a great go ahead. response. Let's go ahead with Glenn. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank. Th thanks, Gary. Uh, and, and in some ways, maybe you can respond to both of this because I'll. I think I'm going to end up in a similar place with Asif uh, around this this question of conflict. But first off, thank you so much uh, for this uh, rich discussion and for sharing the the earlier paper. It's really exciting for me as someone who I think on this panel it's safe to say knows the least about uh, drama uh, to find here lots of resonances with things that I'm 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 concerned with and and I think your project overall um, to really knit together a variety of strands of inchoate things thinking around theater and human rights struck me as really significant, not only for this intersection of human rights and theater, but potentially for, for human rights itself. And, and, and I, I think of it in particular in the way in which the, the phrase culture of human rights is often deployed within my field, within education, in a very um, uh, uh, unnuanced and naive way, right? At the best, it's a kind of term for a socialization into this kind of loose cosmopolitan that we aim for with our students. And in the worst, it's a kind of evangelism for a, a new church of human rights. And by you know, framing theater and human rights in this way, it opens up the possibility of rethinking that notion of culture, which I think is, uh, is actually that track away from what Asif mentioned in terms of you know, breaking the, the legalistic um, uh, paradigm as the, the, the most significant approach to human rights. I am also really appreciative of your interrogation, uh, you know, and, and, and complexifying of empathy. Um, empathy operates as this all-purpose talisman in uh, in human rights discourse, as if it's the the magic key to to all things um, ben beneficial about human rights. And I and I think your 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 insistence on dialogic forms of empathy are absolutely central and make me think not only about the dialogue that needs to occur between the 
audience and the stage, but the potential for dialogue amongst the audience members themselves, if we begin to think about audiences as internally diverse, fractured, and arriving um, at, a, at a performance in, in different locations, and so what that would mean. Um, of course, dialogue is a big part of, uh, of, of, what, I, of what I do. And, uh, and, and your connection then to this next stage, and here's where it kind of comes back to where uh, Asif landed, right? Um, of the, the tension you're, you're, you're describing between rec reconciliation and justice as these key components or, or key motivating features of, uh, of different approaches to, to understanding um, uh, the function of theater in, in, in human rights. And it, and it makes me think about uh, the tension as well in democratic politics between a model of deliberative democracy and agonistic democracy. And, and you, know, you ended by talking about how the challenge of attempts to implement uh, models of reconciliation in, uh, that, that are really grounded in a post-conflict or transitional justice model in spaces in which conflict is ongoing. And it reminds me, of course, of the, the debate between um, uh, 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 Ernesto Leclau and Jürgen Habermas about the fundamental nature of politi politics being conflictual, that, that, that there potentially is no post-conflict society uh, that still has politics, because that is, where, that is what politics is. And if that's the case, then is there something in what you're describing as the role of uh, these theatrical productions in conflict societies that are actually not about simply, uh, you know, the, 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 the officially designated conflict areas, but are really resonant with democratic politics, you know, uh, writ law. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I think that that really um, intrigues me as a, as a different way of framing what you're up to. Thanks. Bastion? So thank you. Um, for, first, I'd like to uh, say how humbled and grateful I am uh, to be uh, asked to respond in this distinguished round and um, and and to comment on the, on this book project. Um, I really I, I can't wait to read the full book and uh, the parts that you've shared uh, with us panelists already are truly exciting and, and innovative in so many ways. Um, what I what I'd like to do here is just to mention a few points that strike me really as essential in the discussion of theater and human rights. And then end with a with a couple of questions. Um, so what I what I really like about your book is that they both recognize the importance of uh, representation in theater, and at the same time explain why it's not enough to only consider representation when we try to understand theater in the context of human rights. And so um, one of one of the problems uh, with the field of human rights and literature in general, and this has been mentioned now already a, a, a few times, but I but I think can't be mentioned enough. Is that all too often literary texts and theater are seen as uh, you know representations of victims and perpetrators, and then the violence or the results of the violence and human rights abuses produces empathy in the audience and the readers, and that's it. So, well, that that's certainly one way in which the literature or theater can have a human rights related impact by making us aware of this violence and letting us feel empathy with the victims. But the theater, as you show, Gary, uh, can do so much more. Um, it's, it, it usually is much more complex than presenting narratives of victims and perpetrators. And as you point out, um, it's not only in the content, content of the play, but also in its form and structure um, in a dialectical fashion that we need to look for that. And I, I love that you, that you take uh, some elements from Brecht's uh, theater, uh, uh, the theory of theater, uh, such as the Verfremdungseffekt, alienation or estrangement effect, and then you use that in your uh, theater aesthetics of human rights. So by engaging the audience and estranging it, um, you get the audience to think instead of sympathize, sympathizing with those who suffer. Um, I, like, I like the way that Brecht put it when, when he distinguished between traditional, what he calls dramatic theater, and uh, his approach that he calls an epic theater, as you pointed out. In traditional, uh, in dramatic traditional theater, the audience says, "This is how it is. I've like I felt like this before. The suffering of the protagonists moves me because there is no escape for them. I cry with those who are crying and I laugh with those who are laughing." But in the theater, that Brecht doesn't mind. It's the opposite, right? The opposite. The audience says, 
It can't or must not be that way. This must end. The suffering of the protagonists moves me because things could have been changed or could be changed and they shouldn't have acted in the way that they did. I laugh with, uh, I laugh about those who are crying and I cry over those who are laughing. Um, so, so your, your approach uh, identifies, I think, exactly this kind of complexity, um, but not only in the kind of didactic theater that Brecht had in mind, but in all theater. And the examples that you uh, show, I think, are really enlightening uh, in, in, in this respect. Um, I, I think what, what, you, what you show uh, um, and what I really appreciate it is that, um, you know, it shows how human rights comes to life, how they are claimed in specific sociocultural contexts, how they fare in flesh and blood, and how human rights claims travel over time within and among different cultural settings. So your examples show in which kind of struggles conflicting human rights claims face. The stage then, um, you know, both say in dramatic theater and the kinds of performances in ethnographic theater practices that you also mentioned, is a very different animal from human rights in declarations and in international treaties or in courtrooms. So that's why I'm, why I'm really excited about your book and that it will provide us with insights into these real life complexities and also with an aesthetic theory of theater and human rights. Now, my, my, my two questions that I have, um, it, it seems to me, and I, 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 I think I, um, this resonates with uh, what uh, Asif and, and Glenn have already pointed out, that you focus on conflict scenarios and primarily human rights violations and abuses and, you know, and, and, and those specific individual rights. I wonder if, if, if you um, um, consider or, or have already in parts that we haven't seen uh, group rights, social e and, and economic rights, environmental rights or intergenerational rights. It may, may be, you know, an, an, an additional issue um, to focus on when you talk about uh, human rights in general. And then the other, um, the other thing is that you, you mentioned um, that tragedy specifically um, and the examples that you've provided and, and, and all sorts of serious theater. But I wonder if comedy uh, would not also be in, in, interesting, you know, especially in the sense of laughing at power, um, uh, laughter as a form of relief or as processing pain and, 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 and suffering and, and, and providing sort of an, um, an, an, a different way of looking at things. So these are my uh, two questions, but thank you again for, for yeah, um, giving really us. Helpful. Those are these are really helpful comments. And just a quick comment on the comedy. You know, uh, uh, James Thompson, who Asif knows, talks about one of his favorite projects in Lebanon during the during the wars in Lebanon, which was called Laughter Under the Bombs, right? Which goes to exactly what you think when you're at that zero zero point of in the place of war at the time of war. The last thing you want to see is Medea, right? And so uh, certainly there's a direct relationship between. And there's nothing better in terms of commenting on human rights abuses than satire, right? So that's a, that's a really good point. Um, in terms of the, uh, uh, the types of rights that you mentioned, right? I'm sort of gonna let the plays do that. You know what I mean? I'm trying to operate sort of a, a more theoretical framework of aesthetics and use specific examples. So the range of examples is still pretty malleable, but um, to Asif's point about it being about conflict, I think that's really interesting. And the nature of conflict as a multiplicit contextual, a contextual thing, uh, uh, rather than a binary, I think it's really interesting. I do think the moral theory is important. And I think it's essential because I think how we think about people who commit violence or whose character is destroyed by external circumstances. It's like Martha Nussbaum says, Hecuba keeps me up at night, right? Because when you look at Trojan women by Euripides, it's the perfect platonic version of character. She maintains her dignity throughout the entire play. Nothing about her character is, is altered by the outside circumstance. But when you look at his other play, Hecuba, which was actually written earlier during a more brutal time in the war, she, she maintains that dignity and sense of character until she doesn't, until every system around her ultimately destroys and she reacts in a brutal way. Now, when I present these plays to my students, say, which one do you like better? They're terrified <laughs> of the second Hecuba and they judge her in terms of the first Hecuba, right? You know, it's really interesting. 
So as we talk about perpetrators and victims, we need to really have a sense of what is what does moral character mean, right? Before we can really think about um, how these characters function in these dramatic environments. I have a, a thought in response to that, but I don't know if yeah. that's what I do right now, Robin. Uh, oh yes, please. I have we, some time. We should go to Q and A pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think my I think my challenge with with that, Gary, is I think I think that the um, and, and sort of my reason for kind of wondering about the, the, the emphasis of, on conflict and sort of the underpinning on conflict is that it's all so contextual, right? Is that in every single circumstance, you know, there isn't, there isn't necessarily, okay, this is what it means to be a good person, full stop, right? There's, this is what it means to be a good person in this circumstance and this circumstance, and, and this is what it means to be this good character in that, you know, in X, Y, Z way. So, so I think, I think I, I think I struggle with that kind of like starting from the position of what the morality happens to be because because that is a particularly and in a number of the of the um, folks that you reference right a very sort of like Western particular sort of like sure. Euro sure. Eurocentric kind of like framework right which might not be the ontology or the epistemology or the sort of like you know cosmology of a particular place where some of these things are happening right and so I think some of the other texts that you refer to in terms of um, Kind of what James has put out, you know, performance in place of war, and then Jenny had put out a subsequent book, performance in in time of terror, and other things like this, right, are wrestling with the question of context because that offers the differentiation of these particular types of performances, and then what are the implications of that for the performance itself? Um, so I wonder then if there's a way to kind of think about the the relationship between those two um, as something, if the morality kind of component feels really central for you. No, that's really important. What, what I guess what I'm proposing is that we have to think about the, the, the moral position of the characters, but that changes in each case study. In other words, the, the, the early theory will say, this is an issue you have to think about. And then the six, the six subsequent episodes, each will contextualize that. So your points well taken, right? Um, Glenn and Sebastian, do you want to, um, should we continue this uh, conversation? I, I, I have a, a sure. comment on the, on this part of the conversation and it's to ask a bit how, um, you mentioned that you were, you know, at the University of Haifa and you ultimately you know, rejected a, a proposal that seemed to, uh, um, um, from, you know, to, to look for other groups to work with because of your fears around how it was going to position this, uh, you know, Palestinians in particular in a post-conflict or conflict situation, like the tensions there. I'm not describing that right, but um, right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how to take this uh, um, notion of process rather than object um, and this um, real uh, complexity around victim, around these categories of victim and perpetrator, uh, into um, into legal context, into um, um, context where there is often a, a, a really a heavy binary opposition placed between those two. And I'm I'm thinking of this in light of the work that I and my colleagues have done in Latin America, in which many, many contexts um, have people who are both perpetrators and victims exactly. at the same time. And it is such a difficult thing to handle, but one where we fully agree that the arts can play a role in expressing those complexities. And that's the, my main reason for, for, for so an effective rejecting theater forms that are essentially didactic along those lines, right? And, 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 but, and too often I feel, I mean, part of this started from my sense that some of these plays are, are studied and performed that way, right? As didactic objects. And if you take, for example, the play of Death and the Maiden as opposed to the film, there's a huge jump. And it, a lot depends on casting. I mean, you know, you've got Sigourney Weaver playing Paulina, you've got Ben Kingsley playing Dr. Gerardo, or excuse me, Dr. Miranda, who, you know, has made half a career about playing sort of squirrely guys, you know what I mean? It's sort of like, it's right away, you know, and, and I'm certainly not saying that we shouldn't empathize with Paulina and her story, 
right? That's a powerful thing that drives the story. It's, it's central to the story. But in a way, it's not what the play is really about. It's the landscape on which the play happens, right? And so that's one of the things in which, you know, I focus on in terms of like dialectic structures. In terms of like the gray area between perpetrators and, and victims, that's exactly the nature of, um, uh, yeah, also just put child soldiers, exactly so, right? The context for these conflicts can only be expressed in theater if we understand that there are no answers at the end of the play, right? And that, the, that, that means both the experience of the play and the study of the play are process, are part of the process. We, 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 we leave the play, oh my God, what do I wanna think about, right? Um, I did a play some years ago by David Edgar called Pentecost which is about refugees moving across Europe. And you know, my friend, Frank Mack, the managing director at the time ran into some, ran into some uh, subscribers at the Big Y. And um, uh, Frank said, how are you doing? And the subscriber said, oh, I, I'm, I don't like that last play you did, Pentecost, I hated that play. And it'd been like a month, right? And Frank said, oh, why, why is that? And the subscriber said, oh, I haven't thought about anything since. You know, and you know that's exactly the win we want. And so, rather than thinking about plays from which we draw conclusions, we think about them as process. Then I think that that helps us think about how an aesthetics of human rights might work. Mm -hmm. Are there any comments or any questions from the group? Um, I'm sure we can keep on. Um, <laughs> people who, from the audience, please put your questions into the chat. Um, we have a few more minutes here. So Denise Abercrombie okay. um, writes, thank you for your engaging presentation. I'm wondering how you situate the works of Anne Deberry Smith in the context of human rights theater. I'm also concerned about the problem of access to theater. Right, great question. I mean, I obviously the work of Anne Deberry Smith is, is fundamental to on, on many levels because she, not unlike, uh, Laramie Project, for example, these are examples of what's called verbatim theater. And there's a, a, a reasonable amount written now, there's more and more being written about the aesthetics of verbatim theater, which is interesting because you think of verbatim theater as being exactly what people say. So how can you have aesthetics? Well, it's really a curatorial process. Uh, you're curating speech in a way that might be curated, like art objects might be curated in a museum to tell a story. And so her work, which is verbatim based, is a really interesting exercise in dialogic empathy because she cuts across all perspectives of what's happening within the space that she's commenting on. And it, I would argue, is not at all didactic, but at times can be confusing and forces, again, to align and lean in and lean back and think one thing or another. The difference is that it's usually with one character or another character, sometimes within the character, right? Uh, but it's certainly a really good example of something that fundamentally becomes dialectic in points of view and, and, and certainly encourages dialogic empathy. The, the issue there is, is that each character is presented to us without us ever ever reacting or engaging with that actual person, right? And in terms of your second question, in terms of access, that's one of the great things about participatory theater. I mean, I argue all the time that if we wanted to look at the single form of theater that's probably produced more than any other form of theater in the world right now, it's probably theater of the oppressed. It's everywhere. You know, it's one of the most dominant forms of theater in the world, in South Asia, in Africa, in South America, in Europe. In New Haven, there's a theater of the press company. And we don't know about it as much because it isn't a commercial enterprise, but it's incredibly useful for any group of people to engage in, as mediation conflict, as giving voice to particular groups, as uh, rehumanization projects, as identity construction projects. And these are really excellent uh, forms to, to, to work on. We got one from Jeremy. 
So Jeremy Pressman writes, in moving away from a perpetrator, a victim binary, is there a risk of uh, letting the perpetrator off the hook, humanizing or complexifying them to the point of losing any distinction between perpetrator and victim? Well, uh, I hope not. But I, you know, I understand the question. Relative values always kind of haunts this conversation, right? In terms of what the effect might be. But if we think of if we think of perpetrator and victim as a continuum, right, as not a binary, then what we may find is that um, the circumstances warrant different levels of understanding. Um, one of the things that Peter does not do is legal litigate prosecution. Doesn't 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 create a prosecution. That's left to legal systems. What if we are if if the theater project is an effect to give, as Michael Lynch points out, a, a, you know, an understanding with a capital U, right, of an environment and the forces that are at play in that environment, then we have to consider all the pieces of the machine. We have to think about all of the parts of it and how they interrelate to each other. So I don't think this. This, this approach to studying or performing theater does that or would let the perpetrator off the hook. And, and even when we understand better what that happens, that doesn't mean they're not responsible, right? Yeah. So there's a very important distinction here, what sort of a vertical hierarchy that I work with my students on between that which is justified, that which is necessary, and that which is understandable. Right. And so when we think about it in that way, something may be justified morally, something may be necessary, and we can debate it, right? Like the use of the atomic bomb in World War II. Was it necessary? Was it unjustified but necessary? Right. Or can we think of other things on that on that plane as as justified, necessary, or understandable? Can I just add one one piece to this, sort of to yeah. make matters a little further, which is I think um, I think performance in and of itself is value neutral, right? And I think this yeah. is a really important thing to bear in mind because performance is not only staging in even if just in the examples that you're speaking on, Gary, right? It's not only just staging things that are attempting to create sort of empathy for victims or something to that effect, right? Like Nazi propaganda prior to World War, like in, in sort of like that era of Germany is a form of performance. Who do power radio stations before the Rwandan genocide is a form of a form of applied theater, right? right? And it's really fundamental, I think, if you're that kind of is gonna be part of the conversation to be wondering about, well, what does it look like when it's not going in the direction that we think it ought to be going in? You know, um, and I and I mean, you know, really, because I, because that's that's part of the conversation too. And I think that's a really under, discussed and underrepresented kind of consideration um, at play. If you think about, again, to the to the Hutu power example, right, you have constantly sort of like a charging up of language, a charging up of language. That's a, that's an applied theater project for an entire country. That's, you know, that's what that is. And, and if we think about it in that way, then it's like, whoa, what does that mean for theater? And what does that mean for theater and human rights? Bingo. Got one from Michael. Um, yeah, so uh, Michael writes, how do you see Tony Kushner's work fitting into your structure? He has often been interpreted as making successful arguments with conclusions or answers, as you put it, for the right for rights in the gay community. Well, I mean, the, 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 the obvious, the obvious um, example of Angels in America, part one and two, are, are you know, you could, you could argue, it has been argued, and I would be sympathetic with an argument that's, that suggests that that's an epic poem of America, right? You know, um, it's a way, you know, other people think it's the Godfather, right? But, you know, the, the, the way that play reaches across society and across various aspects of character, is enormously comprehensive in scope. And it clearly does humanize, um, to some extent, the, uh, the, the LGBT community within the context of a time when it was emergent, right? And also getting killed off, 
right, at the same time. So it was an enormously important project that has, I think, rich human rights implications. The other thing that's really interesting about Angel America is that nobody gets off the hook, right? In terms of the dramatic relationships, everyone is flawed one way or the other. It's about a group of very flawed people. And I, and I think that's really important. You know, some of the best, you know, you might be surprised to learn that most of the plays that I've either studied or seen in Palestine, almost none of them are monologic. They're not protest plays. They're plays that deal with most often the intricacy of Palestinian complicity, of, of cultural flaws, of issues of, um, of women's rights, of how we view ourselves, about the nature of conflict. They're deeply philosophic works. Here's one. Oh, okay. So, so I think this might be the last question that we have time for from uh, Diana English. One of the challenges of human rights in performance done badly, to Asif's point, is the idea that we have to be good to quote unquote deserve human rights. Yes. Exactly. Uh, oftentimes, the examples Asif gives is Nazi uh, is giving Nazi Hutu power are used to dehumanize or distance victims from their access to human rights. Instead, the moral underpinning uh, uh, conversation could be about understanding that human rights are not a result of moral behavior, but in fact, even in spite of it at times. Exactly so, you know, and, it, and there are multiple examples of literature um, in which protagonists say, I'm flawed, but I still deserve to be treated like a human being, right? And that's one of the really interesting things about, it's not that I don't argue for an understanding of moral theory in order to categorize people as good or bad, but rather to understand the delicacy of, of character and to assert that we can't necessarily assume that good character is fixed. It's malleable, it changes, it can be destroyed. And so that changes our view of, of it in the context of some of these plays. Excellent. <laughs> um, I think we're coming up on time. So I think we'll have to stop here, but this is obviously an incredibly rich um, um, presentation that you've given us and we are all super looking forward to reading further um, your book when you get it published, Gary. So um, I'll take this moment to thank um, everyone. Thank you, Gary, our commentators, um, the Human Rights Institute and our audience for participating. And we have recorded this, uh, this presentation and we will be putting it up, I think, on the, uh, on the Human Rights web uh, website um, in the near future. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Bye all. Thank you. Thank you.